Recording. Rebecca Bennett. Hello. 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 <laughs> Welcome <laughs> to uh, this very scenic uh, studio from... In fact, you've known Bags for much longer than I've known Bags. Yeah. How long have you known Bags? I met him in... It would have been 2010, December 2010, when I started at the Royal Tank Regiment as uh, EMI. Yeah. So he got out not long after that. Yeah. I'm sure he got out at the same time as me, 2011, 2012, something. So he must, I think he was out after me and I left in 2012. So, because the RTR was my last posting. So I think he was probably on his way out. I'm sure he left after me. Yeah, but a similar time. Right, okay. So, um, my light's still really bright. Sorry, one sec. Sorry, I'm sorry. Okay. But the issue is, my camera, I'm really bright. You're not really bright, not you, the camera. Oh, right. It's a light. And so, looking between, when, when, they, when I'm looking between the cameras. Oh, it'll look all weird. Yeah, it's just distracting. Going bright and dark, and yeah. bright and dark. If I can fix it, I want to. Back, minor technical issue. Right, so, uh, icebreaker. Excellent answers in the icebreaker, by the way. Excellent answers. Oh, thank you. For some of the questions. <laughs> some were easier than others. <laughs> no. Maybe I should have pre-prepared, I don't know. The inspirations question mm. does get people. Mm. I think it does get people. But, um, but you were talking about, on the, last, on the last question, you were talking about rocket and mortar attack in Basra, yeah. um, 2006, yeah. top telic. What was the first, do you remember the first contact you were ever in? You were ever in? I think it was, it was, Iraq was my first tour um, and <laughs> I'd come out sort of halfway through the deployment of the unit. I'd gone out to um, three battalion Rimi and they were out there at the time, um, usually in Shaiba log base and then occasionally between Shaiba and Basra at the time. Um, and so I'd gone out there late and, um, yeah, I mean, we were just, it was just mainly for us, like Chinese rockets, mortars, things like that on the, on the base. It used to just be sort of commonplace. So I think it was just <coughs> something that you got, um, got really used to. So I think the first time I'd probably been there one or two nights, um, and I was just in, like, we were living in these little, I think they were like ISO containers from what I can remember at the time. And I had, like, one to myself, um, just because it was, I wasn't the only female officer at the time in, in the unit, but they'd already been there a bit and they'd already got their own. So I just happened to be able to have one by myself. And it was the tour before they built, I don't know whether you'd, um, anybody's ever spoken, you, you have experience of it, when they had the put all those breeze blocks around the beds I, they used they did that it was a very strange breeze blocks. yeah so because of all the um the rockets and the mortars that were coming in and so many people were like just dying in the pits and stuff they put they built these um breeze block coffins basically so in your bed was surrounded just by this breeze block um walls and ceiling to try and protect you they were horrendous so luckily i was just in a normal sort of bed setup <clears throat> um so, and I think it was a tour after me that ended up constructing these things because there was people getting injured um, quite regularly from these um, rockets in the mortars. So I think it was about second or third night in and the alarms would ring and you'd sort of be like, oh, and then you'd hear that distant sort of um, crash of the, of the rockets and things like that. So that was my first experience. I didn't do a huge amount of time out of camp during that tour. I moved between Shiber and Basra a couple of times um, in a vehicle convoys and things like that. Luckily, they were um, they were fairly uneventful. Um, but for that tour, it was mainly the the sort of the rockets and um, and stuff that were that were there when we were in in camp. Yeah. How quickly did you become desensitised to that? Because I know you mentioned it on the yeah. you mentioned it on the um, on the icebreak, and it's a really interesting topic to me because yeah. desensitisation I think is really useful short term. Yes. Unfortunately, it's not a switch. You can just flick on and off. I'm sure yeah. you are fully aware, much <laughs> yeah. more right up than I am. Yeah, I mean, so I think it was quite quick. I don't know whether, I can't remember ever feeling 
really scared. I can't remember that, which seems ridiculous to me when I think about some of the situations. I remember once they made us do a um, half marathon around the airfield. This was part where we were going to raise money for like Blesma and stuff like that. And um, it was one of these things that they'd set up and it was due to set that we're starting at 7 a.m. Um, to avoid the heat of the, the desert. And um, just before we're about to set off, there was a load of mortars. And um, <laughs> some of them were, so there was like loads of, and some of them hadn't gone off. So there's lots of unexploded ordnance. And I thought, yes, don't have to do this bloody half marathon. I've done absolutely no training for and got no interest in. But no, they just said, right, when you're running the course, just avoid the bits that we've put a bit of tape around because that's where the unexploded ordnance is. And we were like, oh, right, so we've still got to do the half marathon. I think it was delayed by about 10 minutes while they put a bit of like <laughs> tape out. And I just thought to myself, this is absolutely ridiculous. And lo and behold, we all dutifully trotted around the airfield, avoiding the unexploded ordnance ordinance you know and getting back in. and I never once thought you know I mean I thought it was ridiculously you know bananas that we were doing this sort of thing but it was just part and parcel of it I think you just because I was late in to everything and everybody else had already been there you just sort of like acclimatized to it so quickly and I didn't feel worried I, I felt more worried about doing a good job and like you know making sure I you know performed well and you know I did okay and you know that was my main concern, not whether I was going to die at any moment. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I know. I know what you mean. It's like we were talking before me that it. I think that's, it's a combination of the the way you're training and the British Army prepares people mm. for those situations. It's all. It's also I think. And it, the, desensitization, the desensitization has to be an unwanted thing. It's got to be a negative thing in general, I mm. think. You know, I think it's a combination of that, the training, and then also what people are doing around you. Mm. If everyone else says calm, everyone else is just chilling out, yeah. not scared, no one's free, you can't hear anyone freaking out. I think he's, it's like that herd mentality, isn't it? Absolutely. Okay, I won't scream and shout and yeah. clap. And, you, know. you, don't, you don't want to be the person that's like completely losing your mind, do you? So you sort of just go along with it. And like yeah. when you see other people that aren't bothered by something, it makes you not bothered. You're like, oh, okay, this is all right. They're not losing it. So you feel that it's all right as well. And there's always that like dark humour as well that goes behind everything in the military, isn't it? Where it's like you just... Um, yeah, just laugh and joke about things that really aren't that funny. But it's in a way, it's a way for you to sort of get through it. Did you ever see anyone really significantly mentally impacted it when you're impacted, impacted by it when you're out there? Yeah, yeah, there was. We had um, some reserve soldiers in Iraq, particularly. Um, there was a reserve <coughs> soldier that came to work for me in, in, in the platoon, and he really struggled. Um, I think because he hadn't gone through the same sort of level of training, he wasn't as well integrated, he didn't know people as well as everybody else. So everybody else could rely on their friends and pals that they'd known for years. This guy was coming in as like almost like an individual augmentee into the platoon and he really, really, really struggled with it. Um, he, he was like, I'm just scared all the time, I feel like I'm going to die, you know, he was really, really struggling with that. And I thought that was really interesting and I think... Was he in your unit? Um, he'd come to join as a, yeah, as like a backfill from the reserve to help, you know. But I was like, I, I, my platoon was like the support platoon at the time. So it was a mixture of REMI, RLC, medics, that sort of thing. So I was like the platoon commander for that particular um, bit. And he'd come, um, I forget what his cat badge was, um, irrelevant really, but he'd come in sort of as an individual reserve to backfill the platoon because we were short. And he really, he couldn't, couldn't handle it. So we had to send him back home early. See, he must have volunteered to do that, though. Yeah. But I think maybe the reality of it was... Yeah. And he didn't have that sort of... You know, like you were saying, like the tr the training and the... I think you, we have to say how much there is... Doing that kind of things with your your pals, your friends, having your mucker by your side, you know, that stands for quite a lot. That can get you through some really tough times. And if you're just coming in as an individual and you don't feel like you know anybody, you're completely isolated, you're on that, the outside of that group, you're going to be more susceptible to, you know, to things like affecting you negatively. Yeah, there's also, you've got a, there's like a knowledge gap there, isn't there? Mm. Like you said, about knowing what, you know, what measures are in place to help protect people and what they're mm. likely to get in and all of that kind of stuff that you, we knew second nature 
you know, the group, because like things like you said, the, the additional training, mm-hmm. and then the buddy buddy system. You know, um, what about the other females when you were out there on that tour? So you said you said there weren't many others, but yeah, when I was in um, when I was in Iraq, there was a few because. I, like I was saying, I was part of this support platoon and we had some clerks as well that were part of it. So some, there was quite a few females. I don't think, and there was like one or two other female officers um, and a few female soldiers. But everybody seemed to, yeah, that was all right. That was okay there. What was it like being a uh, female officer in the Remy? Because that is quite a rarity, is it not? Yeah. Well, I'm not saying that's an assumption I'm making. But I think... Yeah, so, I mean, I think at the time when I was in, there was about 50 female officers in the Remy as a whole, and you have to think how big the core is generally. But, you know, one of the requirements to be a, an officer in the Remy is you needed to have a technical degree, so typically something like engineering, and we already know that a lot of women don't do engineering so my degree was mechanical engineering that's what I did and sort of it fitted well how come you ended up doing that um because I really like doing well this I wanted to join the military um and I went to the careers office and I said to the guy you know I really like um he says what do you like what do you like doing at school and I said I like science and I like designing things and he says you sound like you're going to be an engineer I said I don't even know what that is but yeah sounds good <laughs> and then he just pushed two books to, towards me one of them for the Royal Engineers and one of them for re- the Remy and I was like oh, okay I'll have a look at this and then I went on a Remy fan visit and I was like this is the best thing in the whole world they treat me very well I was like I love them so that's why I did mechanical engineering at uni so it was a mistake I absolutely hate my degree but <laughs> oh, no. yeah I did mechanical engineering purely to join the Remy oh yeah but did you hate the job? No, I loved it. Well, I didn't do a huge amount of engineering when I was in, because yeah. I actually don't, I don't think I actually enjoyed engineering as such. Um, so even though my first job when I was in Germany with three battalion, I was the PAX platoon commander. And that's when I went out to Iraq and did that sort of support platoon role. Following that, I didn't really do a huge amount of engineering jobs. I did, uh, I was platoon commander at Basingbourne. I did Remy officer recruiting for a year. I did an individual augmentee job um, in Afghan for um, PSYOPs, which was really good, um, working in strategic communications and sort of deception planning stuff, which was really interesting. And then I finished off at um, RTR. So that again was an engineering type job. And that's when I was like, actually, this isn't, you know, I'm not really into the whole engineering thing. The thing that I really enjoyed about being in the military was the people and the opportunities. And I really liked the part about being a platoon commander and being the, you know, the EME at the RTR was um, having the opportunity to to talk to the the soldiers and the guys and to help with their career and their welfare. And, you know, that part was the interesting bit to me, not that, you know, are the packs working properly? Do we need to, you know, what Land Rovers do we need to fix? Is that battery working? Let's inspect the cosh locker. I mean, I mean, who cares about that? I don't know. So then, then I decided I needed to have a bit of a change. But yeah, that's that's how I ended up where I was. Fucking cosh locker. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And spill kit. Yeah. Um, well, it sounds to me like you you you, you enjoyed the, all the best aspects of being a leader. Yeah. So had you had any leadership experience before you joined up? No. Like, did you know you liked that? Well, I sort of, you know, when I was at school, like if you spoke to my friends, it'd be like, she was the, like the bossy one. You know, I'm always the one that's like piping up, like, listen in, you know, that sort of thing. <laughs> so, yeah, I suppose, and I was sort of a captain of the sports teams and stuff like that. And, you know, and then I went through the whole like officer training call when I was at uni and when I was doing my mech engineering degree at Leeds. And, um, you know, you get opportunities there, don't you, to try. I didn't know I was going to enjoy leadership. I just thought that it felt like it fitted right for me, if you know what I mean. It just sort of, sort of suited my personality. Yeah. Mm. Have you got military in the family? Not really. I mean, I say this, um, my mum joined the reserves, but after I, and I'll say this now, after I had expressed an interest in joining. So she came in, she'd always sort of wanted to when she was younger and never really done it. And then I said, oh, I think I'm gonna join the military. And she'd looked into it a bit more. She's a nurse by background and ended up being able to join quite late into the, the reserves. Um, so she joined a field hospital that was near to That home, is so amazing. She joined. You but, joined up yeah. and then your mum joined the reserves? Yeah. Oh my yeah. God. So, How long did she serve for? She did quite a while, like 12, a good 12 years before she it just got, no she her, the unit did but she she had care and responsibilities my gran was quite old and she needed 
helping at home so it was just a bit difficult for her at the time but she wanted to and she you know it was all at the sort of the afghan sort of time you know so that she probably i think we were almost out on the same tour actually at one stage but yeah which would have been really strange so when she joined the reserves i joined um as a private soldier in that particular unit when i was 17 and a half because i was so absolutely determined that i was joining the military that was there was no other option for me that was it so i joined the reserves until i went to <coughs> university so um i'd done about a year and a bit as a a private soldier in a field hospital doing like combat med tech stuff with no interest in medicine or anything like that at the time like no interest whatsoever mm -hmm. i was like i can't wait to get to do engineering engineering sounds great and then yeah then it's gone full circle, really. Yeah, yeah. Did you, did it when you first joined up? Did the did the expectations match the reality? Your first, I don't know. Say first from your basic training, officer training, through to your first year in unit. So I absolutely loved Sandhurst. I loved it. I thrived there. It was. It still. I still look back at it now, and I'm like, that was my best time in the army. Really. It really suited me. I'm quite rigid, I like rules, I like people telling me what to do and I'll do it. Like, even though I, you know, I've talked about being a leader and stuff like that, I'm not afraid of somebody saying, do this, do that. I'll quite happily, you know, go along with that. It just fit, suited me really well, keeping all my clothes all neat, you know, knowing where you're gonna be and when, a strict sort of um, assessment process that I could like, if I work really hard, they'll see it's a meritocracy, you know, I can do really well. And it just really suited me. And also being amongst these people that everybody, thought like me it felt like I really belonged to something for the first time I think when I'd been at uni you know my friends were very different to me you know it was you know they live were div living different lives you know there were some of them were into like sort of drugs and things like that and I was just like that is not me at all and then when I went to Sanders I was like oh my god I belong this is where I belong and I'd wanted to go to Sanders since I'd watched that documentary on <laughs> on the female platoon at Sanders and I think you know, it had been such an aspiration for me for so long. And I got there and it was just, yeah, I, I, I loved it. I absolutely loved it and I thrived. I did really well. You know, I was a junior under officer at the end of it. Um, you know, it was a real privilege. I stood at the front of the platoon. The Queen was coming round because um, Prince Harry was in my intake. So um, oh, oh, really? she was at the wow. front and it was a real, like a real privilege. And I was like, this is it. You know, I've made it sort of thing. And then I have to say everything from then was a disappointment. Really? Yeah, yeah, it was. Why? It just didn't... It didn't live up to my expectations. It didn't live up to my expectations. Apart from when I was on tour. That was the only other time. Like, so when I was... Pro predominantly when I was in Afghan. The rest of it, I've really struggled with. I, I think it's hard for anyone to get motivated when you're not on ops. Mm. Especially people who have been on ops. Mm. I think generally. Then that's speaking from someone who wasn't an officer, wasn't a commander at that level. I don't know. Why do you think you, why, what didn't you enjoy? Then it felt like a bit of a disconnect. I felt like I didn't fit in as well. Like, so I felt at Sanders like I was part of something. Yeah. And then I went to the unit and I felt like I, I didn't fit in quite as well. Straight away? Straight away. Why is that? Um... I'm not sure. So my young officers course that I did after leaving Sanders, I was the only female on that course. And I knew the guys quite well, but it's quite a small group. And like, um, they were great guys, but again, <coughs> we were quite different types of people. Um, and so I didn't really integrate brilliantly. And so I spent a lot of time wanting to go back and see my friends that I'd been friends with at Sanders and wanting to go back to that sort of thing. So you know, I, I tried avoiding the, the social things, you know, with them, I'd go and go out and get drunk with all my other friends and things like that so I always felt a little bit like I was on the outside there and then when I went to my first unit in Germany that was good actually I have to say like I got on with the people there there's some really good people there and I did really enjoy it but the job as well I felt like yeah is this is this it is this everything that I'd ever worked for you what know? was the job so that was when I was the PAX platoon commander um, at one of the Remi packs, yeah, packs. packs. So you know, in the armoured vehicles, the engine um, gearbox and main assemblies come in a pack, yeah. so that you can completely remove it. I thought they called power cells for some reason. Yeah, the power packs. The power packs. Yeah, right. yeah. So and then you can pull them out and then stick a new one in, and then we can take that pack back to repair and you know, 
um, you know, as far back as you need to be. That's how it was worked. So I was in charge of the PAX platoon for, you know, the battalion, which, you know, supported all the different units and things like that. Um, yeah, I don't know. It still wasn't Sandhurst. There still wasn't that. I don't know. Maybe I just, I like the, how rigid Sandhurst was. I, I like that mm. part of it. And it wasn't, it was more relaxed and chill and, and I'm a more rigid sort of person. <laughs> I don't mm. know. Yeah, there's, there's a subtle difference though, but you see, you said, you, you know, you like being taught what to do. Mm. That there's a subtle difference between that and enjoying direction and clear boundaries mm. and controls. Because they're two different things, I think. Mm. It sounds to me like it was the latter that you're in. Yeah. You, you, it's like, yeah. okay, this, yeah. is what I, this is what I got to do. It's clear. Mm. This is the boundaries within which, within which we're able to operate. Mm. But also, it sounds like you enjoy a bit of pressure. Mm. Yeah. A bit of pressure. Yeah. I th I'm quite similar, I think. I don't enjoy... I need, I need pressure. I need to know what needs to be done. Yeah. As opposed to ambling along seemingly aimlessly yeah you know what i mean it's like a mission need a mission yeah Clear absolutely mission. yeah hmm but then is leadership would leadership of narimi regardless of what role you were doing it that must be a very different style of leadership and type of leadership to what you would have been doing in sandhurst right because mm. sandhurst would be infantry oriented right yes absolutely which is very different yeah yeah did you ever think about transferring? <laughs> <laughs> so, like, Could you have done it back then? No, it's only like been. I mean, I say it's recent, but I mean, it's probably not recent anymore, is it? I mean, I can't remember when they allowed I, women I into the teeth arms. But... I think it was fairly. I think two power only last couple of years. Yeah. Two power have got a female platoon commander. Gosh, or maybe the year before last. I think. I really respect those women that want to do that. I think that's a really tough, tough call. Because it's not necessarily the job, like, I think if we think about the actual job of what you're doing on a day-to-day, -day, that's one part of it. Whether I'd have wanted to do that or not, I'm not sure whether living in a shell scrape or whatever, bayoneting people is necessarily something I'd have probably enjoyed. But <laughs> I think there's like that that battle, isn't there, of going into, I mean, because there's, I mean, the army's very male-dominated anyway, but going into some parts of the army, um, must be very very difficult to be able to um prove your worth you know do you think there's any places that th that should remain men only no no i mean women are more than capable more than capable you know it's just how it into the integration thing and i think that was the only ever the argument like oh well you know how are women going to integrate into, you know, but that's a, a man's problem. Like, sometimes I think that the women are more than capable of doing the job. That's a man's problem. Mm. I'm trying to unpack that. There was all that thing, like, you know, if there was a female soldier that was on the ground and they were injured, the man would have a natural response to be able to save them over <sighs> the, somebody uh, else. I, because if you're, I you know, have said this in the past myself on this mm. very podcast mm. right uh, my opinions have changed over the years uh, i've been doing this about four or five years now and i've definitely had held that opinion up I've, I've, i'm pretty sure i said that myself yeah. you know this ingrained evolutionary mm. need to protect the lady save the lady but yeah. and i think that is the case right mm. it's a vast generalization because it affects people differently um but I think it can be trained out if it exists in the same way that your natural inclination to get the fuck out of camp when there's rockets raining down yeah. can be trained out. You know, we, yeah. we, we, we yeah, you know, yeah. talk about it. I think, I think it can be trained out. Well, and, you know, a lot of, I think a lot of the old and the bold, maybe some of the young people, young guys are probably, maybe, a little very against women having the opportunity to be in frontline units that they weren't allowed mm. to be before be that Hereford or pool to be just some normal infantry unit, you know? Mm. But um, because, because it's being approached from a meritocracy perspective, I don't think it could be argued against. Mm. As long as they've been asked to do the same things 
that men are required to do. And there's yeah. almost those standards aren't because men can achieve those standards. Mm. It's because these are the standards required to need to do that job or mission or whatever the role entails. And yeah. I think it's totally fine. Yeah. And you, you pass and you're in, you pass and you're in. You know, and the male female thing in terms of logistics and infrastructure that I only that only really is a major problem I think at home camps showers yeah. accommodation like if major changes would be needed if all of a sudden there was loads of women on the front line units right because yeah. um, you would need you would need major changes but it's not going to happen you know mm. I mean all of a sudden get a massive percentage of the army the infantry yeah. be all of a sudden female it can happen it can changes can be made incrementally I think I think for the in general, it's a good thing yeah. that more women are, that that women are being more encouraged to go for it and being able to meet the standards and get in, yeah. because at the end of the day, it increases the pool size from which the army can draw frontline troops. And yeah. the bigger the pool, the more selective you can be. Mm. That makes sense. Yeah. And the higher caliber you can have in your ranks, I think. Absolutely, you keep the standard, and then if people reach that standard and are able to do that, then there's no reason, as far as I can see, that they shouldn't be allowed to do that. And I think having that sort of mixed gender teams, I think, is really beneficial in terms of how people work together, decisions that are made, you know, um, emotional regulation, all that sort of thing. You know, I think, yeah, you know, we see it in business. We see it all over the place. I know the military is a very different sort of thing, but I definitely think there's things to be learned from, from these. The one area I do see it a bit, see it uh, problematic though is male-female relationships mm. when you're away on tour. Yeah, I think there's an increased likelihood of that happening and causing problems for the effectiveness of a unit. I don't see how you can effectively mitigate that risk mm. of relationships developing in a section, in a platoon, in a company. But then you've had attached arms that have been female for ages, you know. I, as the Remy attached to the RTR, as a medic attached to, you know, a section, as, you know, a clerk attached to a battalion, you know, you've had this for ages. It's just not been the women that have been holding the, you know, the bayonet. It's been, they've been paying you money or, you know, seeing you in the med centre or whatever. And it's the same on tour, you know, these women are still going out on patrol in Afghan, weren't they? And as part of like your female searchers or your medics going out, you know, this has been around. Yeah, but limited in number and mm. percentage and levels of integration into the actual infantry unit, right? Mm. And there was always a level of segregation generally. Mm. And to be honest, it was very rarely, from, well, I did see relationships like that happen. Um, and it was very rarely with, the junior ranks mm. because the people who are engaging regularly on an interpersonal level for job reasons was generally you know between sergeant between commander and up really mm. so i mean if that's the though where those relationships did occur they could be e the impact could be easily isolated where i think if you look forward and i don't hypothesize that 10 percent of the infantry in the future 20 percent of the infantry maybe 50% of the imagery in the future is female. Mm. I think that problem magnifies itself. Mm. Um, obviously, I'm making great leaps here, <laughs> talking about ifs and whats yeah. and buts, but it's the only area I think being an issue because then, it, it, it can impact the, the cohesion of the unit. Mm. I think, you know, you know what blokes are like mm. when a woman's in, when a woman is involved anywhere and turns out yeah. anywhere especially when you're talking about on tour like it is distracting it is distracting mm. for multiple different reasons you know and and it's one of the reasons i think most of the it definitely sergeant majors i was around on the different tours i did they want if there was a woman attached to the company or the, or the battalion or whatever unit you were at they it was the, the rules about it, it was strict measures put in place to stay the fuck away and you were told or anywhere near her or them sometimes mm -hmm. you have more for, for those reasons they just see problems mm -hmm. i don't know how isolating for the female though isn't that like you know those strict rules that sort of segregation that you know, she's never going to be part of the team, is she? Never going to feel like she's really part of it. She's going out there doing a job, you know, 
amongst everybody. And she, there's been those systems put in place to say, you know, keep her away. Yeah, but it's not because of her. It's because of the situation. You could argue it's because of the men, equally as because of the woman. Yeah. Um, but what's the alternative? I don't know. I think this is the, the, the age-old problem, isn't it? It's the, it's the brotherhood, you know? And that's it. It's about being a female in a predominantly male environment. And that's why, you know, I have the utmost respect for these women that want to join the infantry. And like I said, it's not because of the job that they're doing. It's because of the, um, the tribe that they're attempting to integrate into. And that's really difficult because of the way that we are in society, because of all, you know, the relationships between male and female, you know, the emotions that, you know, all of that stuff. That's why it's, it's difficult you know, not because of the job, not because they have to run a PFT in whatever time it is or, you know, carry heavy weight or, you know, close with and destroy the enemy. That's not the hard bit, in my opinion. The hard bit is the integration into the brotherhood. It's not the hard bit for a woman, you mean? I think that's the hard bit for the woman, yeah. And for the men on the other side too, as, as, as well, to accept that integration. It's, it's difficult for both sides, isn't it? Yeah, see, in my ahead I got whirling around in the back of it I'm thinking and I'm just I'm just thinking out loud here. okay <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking that maybe maybe that divide exists for a reason and it's very particular to two things like uh, to, to soldiering mm. to infantry mm. units because are men more suited to violence than women? Enacting violence than women? Data would suggest so, wouldn't it? <laughs> 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 you know, men have always been more violent, you know. You express your emotions outwardly and women express their emotions inwardly, you know. And you have to look at prisons and, you know. Why is that? It's, you know, do you, with evolution isn't it and how men and women in the, in those sort of like you know in the past in those cavemen eras how it's how you've the roles of society have developed from so yeah but you see it in mental health wards you go to a male mental health ward and they'll be kicking off they'll be angry they'll be shouting they'll be punching people but it's a lot of aggression yeah you go to a female mental health ward and it's about They'll be hurting themselves. They'll be trying to cut. They'll be trying to damage themselves. The question is, right, did, does that difference in... So I, I, this, is, uh, this is how I see it, is that mm. men's best tool, men's, men's go-to tool and best tool they've got is violence, physical mm. violence, right? Women's is emotional violence. They're just mm. Women are great at that. Men are great at physical. Women are great at emotional. Mm. Yeah, and using those as tools to influence... Mm. Right? Yeah. I'm generalizing. Okay. The question is um, men are more physically capable than women, right? General yeah. generalizing. Yes. Okay, but generally yes. The question is did the did men's capacity for violence and women's capacity for emotion ability to emotionally influence mm. don't want to say manipulate emotional mm. influence compared to men and men physical influence, did they evolve because of physical tr differences between the sexes or did the physical differences evolve after or uh, because of the emotional mm. side we have to think about you know let's not kid our biology you know God. women are the ones that are going to be having the babies that are going to be raising the babies and men are going to be going out and the hunting and they're you know protecting the homestead i mean the women can do the protection of the cave and the men are out, you know, if they're, you know, the men are out, the women still are able to protect their young and protect the home. You know, it's not completely, you know, incapable of doing anything. But that is the role, that is human nature. And then from that, society has developed, hasn't it? So we have taken those roles and, you know, exacerbated them in some way. So that's exactly, that's exactly the reason why, I think you were alluding to it, correct me if I'm wrong, 
I think you're alluding to maybe, or you were touching on it, in that the patriarchy, this patriarchal mm. system that we've got at the minute, which mm. is slowly the gap between male and female is closing, but yep. it sounded like that the you're insinuating that's a social construct. Mm. I don't think that's the case. I think the origins of it is not a social construct. I think the origins of it is, is exactly as you just described, physiological okay. differences, right? Yeah. But I think the differences have been magnified, certainly. Yes. By society over time. Mm. But I don't think it's a construct, per se, just because of society. Like, it's not something that was we haven't created this... We haven't... We be men haven't mm. created this system. It's like, right, men are the bosses, women are not. That's it. It wasn't like a decision point back in the day. Mm. You know? And I think that's what people forget these days. Mm. Go on. <laughs> Go on. I think that's that's that is interesting, isn't it? And you I have did to not think, know if you're going down this dodgy <laughs> road. So, like, you know, back in the day when women were sort of queens, like heralded as these, like almost goddesses, you know, held upon, you know, as in something to be, yeah. You know, yeah. That absolutely there to be protected yeah. and like adored, and they are the bringers of life. You know, it, without women, you know, we bear children. We are, you know, the mother of the human race. This is whole thing. And there is an element of the patriarchy that said, hang on a minute, no, you know, men are in charge here, we're, the, we're in control. When was that? Oh, I don't know, when was it? Right. <laughs> <laughs> it was a long time ago, definitely. But it's almost like women's power has been erased over time. You know, this whole idea about the female strength has been really minimised to being just some sort of person that can just look in after the home and clean up and look after the kids. And women are strong. Mentally and physically. Yes, yes, okay, I can't bench press as much as you can. Well, I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> I, who knows? But, you know, I, I think we have to be realistic in the fact that, yeah, physically, yeah, if we, we were having a physical fight, you would beat me. You know, that is just that is just the way it is. But women can bring so much to the party that I think is really minimised by society at the moment and we do live in a patriarchy and it is that is that has been created by men it makes me sound like I'm a real like disagree with you. <laughs> i don't it has i can't right so i'm not a man hater by the way please don't no, I know, like I, know. I, I hope I that know. doesn't come across <clears throat> no, that's not the case at all because everybody has their important part to play absolutely but so this this the this the thing with it saying there was a decision point on this mm. It's easy to look back in retrospect and, this, and think this, mm. right? But you can't pick that out. Yeah. And if it was the case of a decision point, then all of this patriarchy, in inverted commas, mm. would have, the origin would have been in one place in the world and would have spread to other places. In reality, everywhere evolved the same way. It's not just like the UK or the West mm. as this, this men, male-dominated society, mm. right? And I mean male-dominated workforce, definitely, leadership positions, definitely. I think it's just the way we've evolved and we've got the point we've got to now. Yeah. I think 70s, 80s, 60s, 70s, 80s, when everything started changing and we started, it's almost like a, it was almost like a, an enlightenment around the way we perceived both sexes. Mm. You know, and there was, a, there was a shift in the way women were being perceived and that has led us to where we are now, which mm. is a, a vast improvement on where we were then. 60s, 70s, and a vast improvement in when we were, where we were in the 1800s, mm. you know. And I think uh, the West has done the best at that in, in terms of trying to even things up. Mm. Uh, um, and other parts of the world are, are way behind. Other parts of the world haven't shifted for thousands of years. Mm. It hasn't moved for thousands of years. But I don't think there's a decision point on it at some point. And there was a decision that meant we just weren't intelligent enough to be able mm. to do that back in the day. It seems <laughs> so far forward, you know. Yeah. I think some of the differences are exploited, di different countries, different cultures, mm. but um, I think we're moving in the right direction. You yeah. Know. Uh, yeah, we're definitely moving in the right direction. I think we're, yeah, in, in a lot of ways, I think we're making it very difficult for ourselves. I think in some ways it would have, was easier when, you know, the man was the one that went out to work and the woman was the one that stayed at home and looked after the children. In terms of, I think it's stressful for both 
um, you know, the man and the woman in a relationship or, you know, I know we're talking about like classic gender roles here, but like, you know, I think it's difficult for the man now as well as the woman. The woman's trying to look after the children in the home and go out to work. The man's also trying to look after the children, look after the home and go out to work. And, you, you know, it's difficult and it's creating these everyone's just exhausted everyone is just working so hard to try and do these different things and we've lost that you know and i'm not sure what the answer is to it because i'm not suggesting i'd make a terrible housewife i think you know i drive my husband mad if i was at home just doing looking after the kids i think being a housewife is one of the hardest jobs there is going like you know full-time childcare and all that you know i really respect the people that can do it i definitely wouldn't be able to but you know it's difficult like i'm not able to make my husband sandwiches for him for his lunch because I'm off to work earlier I work longer hours you know I'm in a stressful job so I can't support him and he earns more money than I do I mean I work in the NHS like he earns loads more than I do but I can't support him enough with that because my job's stressful and you know long hours and things like that and I think it's been really it's really difficult for us as a society to try and do everything nobody's got any money so it's not like one of us could give up work and you know stay at home even if we wanted to because everyone's so poor so have we done ourselves any favours? We've opened all these doors, you know, and said, oh, actually, you can do this, but are we creating more problems for ourselves? I don't know. I'm not an expert oh, in this. Oh, so saying <laughs> the patriarchy may not be a bad oh, idea. Oh, I don't no, know. Take I, me back I, to the patriarchy. No, 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 thank no, you. no, no, no. I know, I, 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 know ex I know exactly what you mean. Mm. You know, it's, I, there's, there's definitely been things over the last five, ten years, you think, that, you know, that course of action, that agenda, that, um, that initiative that's been created or, or undertaken to level up the playing field between men and women mm. actually might, may be a bit damaging. Mm. Uh, and some some of them are, you know. I mean, I I want to I want to live in a world where everyone has the opportunity to go and try and do what they want to do if they want to try and do that. You Absolutely. Know, regardless of your skin color, your your sex, your yeah. whatever. And I think, I think we're we're close to that. We're close to that now than we ever have been. I think it's the most. Uh, now, some industries, some cultures, some industries, yeah. some jobs. It's not quite as even as other places. Yeah. Army, case in point. Mm. You know, construction industry, case in point. Oh, yeah, Childcare yeah. industry, case in mm -hmm. point. But what we need to be really careful of is that we don't. And this is ha this happens all the time. Fucking government do it all the time. Is that they set these unrealistic targets to be hit yeah and it's like you it's basically setting you're setting someone up to fail an example is we want to hit you know we want to hit 50 percent of all 50 percent of all boards of uh, FTSE 250 companies in the uk we want those boards to be 50 percent women as an example God. Oh, why go on? I want to know. Well, I just, I, 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 I really hate these noise. targets because I think it should be done on merit, and I really think it's important to get a good mix of people being represented on a board. Because I think if you are, you know, like I said before, I think these mixed gender teams are more successful. I think you know <clears throat> having that balance of male and female perspectives, I think, is really useful and beneficial in in, in business and you know in lots of different areas. But it should be done on merit as well. And it should be done on, you know, you work hard, you're good at your job. You can get that role, not just, oh, we need to fill this quota or you look the right sort of size and shape and colour and whatever. And we're just going to drag you in and, and, and stick you on it because that's not fair on anybody. And it causes resentment and it causes division. And yeah, I don't necessarily agree with that. No, yeah, no, yeah, I agree. That's, that's kind of the point I was getting to. Mm. It's got to be done on merit. You know, and we're, we're you know, we're, we're women are concerned you're always going to be at a disadvantage i think you're always going to be at a disadvantage where if if the target is 50 50 representation across everything ever be that leadership position mm -hmm. be that uh, um some industry be that infantry units percentage whatever because and the for one main a main reason is you you said it you give birth to the entire human race all the time you know so at any given moment there are less women available mm. to be in the workforce full time than there are men. Yeah. Now that I'm really high level in this, but just on the mathematics, it's just not it's never gonna be possible. Mm. However, however, the percentages can still be evened up a lot more than what they are now. Yeah. You know, and I think as the generation above us ceases to be around anymore, then that level of 
th- their attitudes towards the male female divide are very different to what we have yeah. and ve- even and vastly different to what our children have you know i think as they disappear and as and as you know and as the the more enlightened of us become mm. the top tier in age terms of society i think it's going to get even better for for women and for any slice of the demographic you want to you want to look at. I think it's so, I think it's going in the right direction, but we can't yeah. set these uh, these bad targets because mm. the things you're just never going to hit, and it, and it always looks bad. Yeah. Was it? There's no progress, yeah. which is just. I think, that it, like I say, I think it causes division. People then look and go, "Oh God, women—they're only getting these jobs because we need to hit these targets." And you know, instead of actually bringing people together, and you know, I think all of these things—you yeah, exactly. know—you think, "Oh, it's, it's this positive discrimination," and exactly. people speak really disparagingly about you know people. And that's not how it should be. And it's, it, it, I just don't like these, you know, divisive things. We should be trying to work together and, you know. Exactly. It, it, that's the first question I ask myself when I, mm. when, I, when I hear someone talking disparagingly about a female who got into, especially the military, mm. who's doing this, that, and the other job. I, I ask myself, what did they do to get that role? Yeah. Did they do what they had to do or was things made easier for them? They did what they had to do. <laughs> what are you fucking arguing about then? They're doing exactly what <laughs> I had to do, or so you know. There's no argument there. Yeah. So, so you, you, like you're saying, you've got to in the systems and the processes, you've got to remove any opportunity to undermine mm. what that person is achieving. That's it. It's changing those perceptions, isn't it? Like you know, you always knew that as a female turning up to a regiment or whatever, they'd all automatically assume you're going to be shit. You're either going to be shit or somebody had like, you know, who's going to sleep with the first, what's it, you know, it's all those sort of thoughts. So to be like respected in any way, you had to be even better than, you know, the average guy. You had to be even better at your job, faster at running, you know, really clean as a whistle, couldn't be doing anything, you know, that, that was just it because people have had this perception of you, just going to be shit. Oh God, we're getting a woman in, bloody hell. You know, they don't be disappointed. Just get some bloke in. Nobody would even think about it. Just be like some, you know, regular guy just coming in and doing the job. And he could just come in and just be bang average. As a woman, you always had to be that bit better. Yeah, I don't... I think that varies that actually... Well, I know it varies from unit to unit and job mm. to job, right? I, 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 I've spoken about this before. I don't... I don't ever remember... On, on tour anyway ever remember hearing that was a we were going to get a woman attached to us and thinking for fuck's sake I never I don't mm. ever remember thinking that mm. I do the only time I remember thinking negatively about a woman being attached to us um, was she got attached to us and she was not fit and she was overweight mm. right now and I was not happy about that but I was not happy about that in exactly the same way as someone else yeah. in the same unit was fat and overweight, but it was a bloke. It was yeah. the same, yeah, yeah, fuck's yeah. sake, yeah. fuck's sake. We're not messing about you, why? And it was a, why are they sent us mm. her? Not because she's a she, yeah. why are they sent us the person who was not physically capable? Mm. Because she was coming out with us on mm. on patrols and yeah. things. You know, you can't, you can't be fucking about, but that's the only time I remember thinking negatively about a woman being attached, but it, was, it wasn't because she was a woman, it's because yeah. she wasn't physically fit enough. She should, it was, and it wasn't her fault for being there. She should not have been sent to that unit. I think you're right. I think maybe, you know, it is probably different depending on where you go in and what jobs there are. And maybe that's a bit of our own perception as well. You know, I think maybe if that's happened to you once, maybe then you presume that that's going to happen to you everywhere you go. There's a lot of that that's, that you carry around with you as well. You know, maybe that's my own sort of self-doubt coming out. Maybe when I went to a unit, I thought, my God, I've got to be better. They must be thinking I'm shit. You know, maybe that's something that I I felt. Because I have to say, I was never treated particularly differently. There was a couple of minor things where I thought, you know, that's a bit dodgy, you know, looking back on it now. But at the time, like, you know, I I turned up at my job. I did my job. I was accepted, especially, like, the RTR is probably the most you know, male-dominated place that I worked, you know, coming from the Remian, they were great with me. They just, like, I just fitted in. Maybe it was my own self-doubt that I needed to be more manly, you know, I needed to be, really, like, lose my femininity to be able to fit in. That was probably from my internal self rather than from what they were... But did you join them on tour? No, I didn't. No. Oh, I thought you did. No. Oh. So I'd come back straight off Af- from Afghan. I'd had a, my post-tour leave and then I started at the RTR. So, oh. yeah. I didn't Could... go out with them because I signed off during my time. So when they were going back out 
again during um when was it like 2011 i think some of them went out 2012 time i was signed off so i didn't have to go with them they went out no well rtr were attached some we had some rtr attached to three power 2010 2011 yeah i know that but they may have gone out yeah again. so i think they were there when i was there in 2010 i was working in um rc south headquarters so I think they were out at a similar time because they had um, some casualties and things like that, hadn't they? And then we came back around the same time. Probably, I don't know how much difference there was. Um, but yeah, they did. And they were, you know, as it was at the time, wasn't it? Rotating time and time again through, you know, going out on tour and things like that. And I was with one RTR at the time. It was before they'd amalgamated, so. I think, I, I, I think attitudes to, um, I think attitudes to women on the front line changed in a big, big, big way when Iraq and Afghan happened. Yeah. Because with a couple of reasons. Well, one main reason, we were on operations and merit, meritocracy yeah. r- rules over everything, everything. Yeah. And before those campaigns started, we hadn't been doing much. I mean, the military, the mm. army, generally, yeah. Yeah, hadn't yeah, yeah. been doing much. Little small operations here and there, Macedonia, Bosnia. You know, we had Gulf One in, in the early nineties, but between Gulf One and two thousand one, so that ten years, even the ten, even the eighties before that, back into nineteen eighty two, the Falklands, there wasn't a lot going on. Mm. And when there's not a lot going on, people become assholes. <laughs> people, you know, no, no, people yeah, become absolutely, assholes. yeah, yeah, yeah. And, no, I agree. And big divides happen, yeah. and I would argue that. There's a lot more sexism in the workplace, in the military. When they had too much time years. on their hands, didn't exactly. they? That was it. Exactly. Yeah. 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 We, yeah. When did you join? What year did you join? 2000. Okay. So, yeah. not So, similar sort of time. It was a busy time, wasn't it? Iraq and Afghan. I mean, like it's I, the best I know. Time. It's the best time. Best time yeah. or worst time. Yeah. 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 Good and bad for lots of different reasons. But, gosh, yeah. It's strange to think about it now. When did you get out? 2012, I left. That's when I started medical school. You're after me. Yeah. Yeah. Why medical school? Ah, so... <laughs> different kind of mechanics. Yeah, different well, basically, kind of I was like, oh. Um, so, basically, I think my husband had done Afghan like three times. I'd um, done Iraq and Afghan, and we were sitting on our honeymoon, and I sort of said to him, I was like, I don't know whether I want to keep doing this, you know. It seems like every time we go, we're like gambling a little bit, like a roll of the dice. And I'm thinking, oh, are we both going to make it back the next time we go? You know, we've just got married. We want to have kids. We want to settle down. Gosh. And I was thinking, what's my next job? And I was thinking, I'm going to have to do a staff job before I get like um, company commands. You know, I thought, because I was just coming, you know, I knew my next job was going to be this um, workshop command job at the RTR. And I was like, after that, you know, what are the jobs going to be? Staff jobs. It's going to be basically behind a desk, like doing plans and policy and things like that. I don't know whether I'm interested in that. And then when you get company command, it's going to be, you know, writing S jars like for the whole of my life. And I'm just like, I don't know. Again, that's not really what I'm, I'm into. And I sort of said to Stu, my husband, I was like, look, I need to, I'm thinking about doing something else. I don't think I really want to be in the military anymore. This is like getting a bit tiresome here. We're, we're risking a lot you know, for not very many rewards, you know, we're still poor, like, even though we'd saved loads of money on tour, we managed to spend it all, I was just like, you know, we need to, we want to settle down and, um, you know, have family and stuff like that, and I don't necessarily want to do that in the military, so then I had to think about something else, and my best friend from school was a doctor, and she'd done medicine, like, as a degree from after we'd done school, and she was, like, a medical registrar in Birmingham in a busy, like, inner city hospital and the stories she was telling me the dramas my god it sounded so exciting she's like wrestling people to the ground there's blood squirting up the walls I'm like this sounds great like because I obviously wanted to have some more action but not necessarily you know threat to life action so I was like well medicine sounds like ideal and plus I get to go to uni and that sounds really relaxing right just having a few years writing little notes in a notebook (laughs) chilling out (laughs) how easy can this be I thought to myself like I mean how naive I was so I said to Stu I was like I think I'm going to do medicine but you know obviously it's quite difficult to get into graduate medicine because it's like super competitive so I probably won't have a chance anyway but I'm going to give it a go signed off from the military you know the whole like years notice that I'm going to be leaving and then started the preparation for trying to get into med school so yeah that was probably it I mean I did like there was a lot of stuff I had a lot of my guys um, particularly when I was in the RTR as well that were struggling quite a bit with the mental health, like post-Afghan stuff. And 
you know, that was something that I was just like, gosh, I really want to be able to help these guys with this stuff. You know, this is the important shit. I don't really care about the Kosh Locker. I care about these guys and what they've had to see and the fact that they're being, it felt like a bit abandoned really. And, you know, I felt like there needs to be more stuff. I, you know, I want to be able to help them, but I don't know what I'm doing. I'm just some, you know, just some person that's, you know, yeah, I'm an officer, but I know nothing about how to help these guys. And you sort of give them a bit of like, you know, pep talk and let's see if we can get you some help and you know oh it sounds really terrible I'm not surprised you feel so awful but I felt like I couldn't really cope with it so had that sort of in the back of my mind as well not imagining that I'd get into psychiatry sort of later down the line um but yeah that was the sort of the route I wanted to work more with the people I wanted to you know do something that was really what I saw as important and that was helping people and also I thought it'd be a good laugh to do medicine because I thought yeah how hard can it be so yeah that's why I did it <laughs> so was it so what was the what were the what was the care in place and support in place for the RTR lads and lasses at the time do you know what, what? was missing it it felt like like who were we referring to them to at the time because it was before like op courage and all that sort of stuff was out and about um I think there was like there was a centre, wasn't there? You could just basically refer somebody to something and then they had to wait to be assessed for ages. And then it didn't really feel like there was much at the time. You know, they'd be coming into my office like quite like regularly saying, I can't cope with it. I'm getting these flashbacks. I'm getting these images of like my pal like burning, you know, and I can't get it out of my head. What am I going to do about it, boss? And I'd be like, um, you know, I don't know. Like, let me see. Like, who can I ring? Like, you know, it just felt like... There was a process, but people weren't really understanding it as much. It was, you know, I think we're a lot further down the line now in trying to understand it and help. We're still not perfect. My God, there's a long way to go, but we're a lot better now than we were like back then in like sort of 2010, 2011. You know, people wouldn't talk about it. They'd be like, oh yeah, he's gone a bit mental now. You know, it's sort of almost that disparaging like stigma that comes with people sort of admitting that they've got problems. And like some of the guys, would be able to sort of vocalise it and say that they were having flashbacks. Some of them had just turned to drink, fighting, you know, that other ways of managing it. But there was a general, you know, and because the Remy guys would often go off with different people, you know, it wouldn't necessarily be things because they'd, um, you know, had it from a, a recent tour or whatever. There was just, it just felt like everything was really disjointed and there wasn't that support that was, that they needed. Yeah, it definitely improved at that point, um, but it still wasn't where it needed to be. Oh, isn't where it needs to be now, but it's no. not far off. I, when I when I came back from the '06 tour in Afghan, like that was, it was nothing. No, it was like uh, we went we went to Cyprus on the way back for one night. Yeah, we just got wasted, just like drink right. loads of like. It was They'd almost like throw the cans of lager at you, was, wouldn't you? It was carnage. Yeah, you know, I mean, it was just scrapping. Yeah. It was yeah, just yeah, scrapping, yeah. To, like hundred odd people. It was yeah. carnage, and um, and I think we had a brief in the Padre about mental health, <laughs> and that was like it. But you know, I, there's I know so many people who who left the military. 07, 08, maybe 09, left the military because they were fucked. But mm -hmm. they signed off and they left. They were yeah. fucked. Yeah. And because they couldn't cope with it, because of the care there, and they didn't want to be in it, and they maybe they didn't want to go away on tour again. Uh, and they left and they took themselves away from that care. They went into Civvy Street, off the radar, and it just got worse. Yeah. You know, some of them aren't around anymore. And some of them are. And they just, I feel like they could have had a such a better the last 10 15 years could have been so much better for them mm. if the right support had been it then and not just support i think a big part of it is just knowledge about mental health mm. mental well-being just understanding it a little bit because you know when you understand something more you have the ability you have, the, you have a better ability to deal with it when it's mm. something to do with you or something to do with someone else and you more, you more likely to go and yeah, go and do something about it. And this, you know, there's literally guys go out and have had a fucking nightmare for ten feet. I did not have the greatest time when I left. Mm. <laughs> I did not have the greatest time when I left. Yeah. You know, um, and this guy's got it much worse than me. It's just such a shame. You know, they could have stayed in, stayed in for another year or so. Mm. I'd got the care they deserved. They maybe stay in, or they maybe get out. But at least they would have been better. And not just guys, girls as well. Maybe they would have been in a, in a, in a much better place. 
you know, I think there's much less chance of that these days, and the stigma's definitely whittling away, but... But we've still got a culture of, um, you know, we build, and part of the training, I know we've spoken a bit earlier about, you know, military training and what it prepares you for, you build a resilience. It's almost like you need to be able to cope with the horrors, that you build that resilience. You're not, you shouldn't show weakness, you know. That is something that's drilled into people in, in their training, and that's, you know, that sort of, you know, formed through how we do things, you know, whether that's, you know, literally, you know, don't show, you know, don't cry or whatever. I'm not saying necessarily that, but it's it's almost like you're, you're, you're supposed to be strong, you know, you're a soldier. So that is the sort of what you are trying to, to be, to become. You're a strong soldier, you know, don't show <coughs> weakness, be resilient. You know, you've got to, you know, fight the good fight. You know, you, it's all these sort of things in this imagery. And then alongside that, you've got the stigma of, you know, being, you know, being a biff, you know, always have to go to the med centre or I can't cope with it. You know, all that sort of thing about like leaving your pals to deal with it while you're, you know, it's weakness, right? That's what people think. So you've got that combination of you must be resilient. This has been trained into you. Don't show weakness. You know, you're a strong man or woman, you know, don't, don't show that weakness. You've got to keep on going. Then you've got the stigma of, being injured in any way, like going and being like downgraded, you know, being a biff, like that term, I don't even, hopefully it's not being used anymore, probably still is, but you know, being called a biff, you can't, but especially if you're a biff for mental health and everyone's just like, you know, best not talk to him. Plus you've got the, don't let him have a weapon because he might shoot you or somebody else, you know, God forbid you should be on an antidepressant, that'd be the end of you, you know, you'd be using a twig when you go on exercise instead of a rifle. You know, all of these different things is really stigmatising and then you're wondering why people aren't asking for help and what they prefer to do is just think, actually, I'm just going to deal with it myself, I'm going to leave the military, I'm going to self-medicate with a load of alcohol and I'm going to drink myself into a depression and then struggle later on down the line to find anybody to talk to and they just don't have anybody because nobody understands it because can't talk to their wife because the wife wasn't there and they can't talk to their pals the pals in Sydney Street have got no idea what they were doing. Mm. There is a balance to be struck though, right? Because you're talking about things then and some of those things are necessarily not evils, but they are I think they're misinterpreted or 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 misused. Um, so there is there is you, you don't want a team of weak people. You do not, right? no. And when I say weak, I mean people who are not at the required standard. Yeah. Right. Mentally or physically. Yeah. You know. And there is definitely something to be said for discouraging being under the standard. Mm. If that discouragement promotes looking after yourself better and and reducing the likelihood of being a Biff. Now, your experience of the word Biff seems to be different than my experience of the word Biff. Biff is just slang for being sick. I didn't mind getting called a Biff on the times when I was on the sick. I was on the sick a couple of times with injuries. Um, but there's, there is a balance. Mm. You know, there is, there is advantages to not showing pain in certain few circumstances there is advantage to being able to push through, uh, you know, to push to a higher pain threshold than would otherwise than you would otherwise go to. Being yeah. pushed to these yeah. limits, but the times in which you need to do that are very few, and mm. these are frontline battle situations. I think that's why these these attitudes exist mm. in that frowning on people who are sick, frowning on people who are appear mentally less resilient mm. than someone else. But the balance is those people who do have problems, who are, who are under the standard for some reason, they should not be discouraged from going and seeking a way to resolve that mm. and improve themselves back to where they need to be, want to be, or moving into a different role where they're better off being better suited. Because sometimes these things happen because people in the wrong role, right? Mm. And that's where, the, that's where the balance is an issue, and that's where the unwanted stigmas come about. Mm. But I think I, mean, I think we have to be careful in that you know, mental illness isn't a weakness because somebody is mentally unwell. That is not because they are not strong enough or not resilient enough. You know, it is a disease and it can affect literally anybody. And just because somebody may not temporarily be appropriate to do something because they've suffered, 
you know, doesn't mean that they are wouldn't be able to do that again in the in the future. And I think we have to be realistic in what we were expecting people to do in Iraq and Afghanistan in particular was bloody horrible. And the fact that people have had to see that stuff and be, partake in those things and be witness to the horrors of war in that way and then just be able to just go, oh yeah, it was all right. Just, you know, just nothing, was it? You know, and just get on with that. That's not going to be... Some people just aren't going to be able to to deal with that. And that doesn't mean that they are weaker or not as good as everybody else. It just means that they might need a little bit more help processing that at certain times. And, you know, I just don't... I, I just I just want to be careful about, you know... With, when I'm using the term weakness, what I'm saying is, you know, as training as part of the military, we're told to not sort of show any weakness as part of our training. And it's very difficult to be able to be specific about when you should sh or shouldn't show weakness. That's why training is that, that generic way. It'll just prepare you for that situation. I don't think anybody that has a mental illness is weak. I think that anybody that can admit to struggling with their mental health is actually pretty bloody brave, particularly if they've been in the military, to be able to put your hand up and go, actually, I'm really struggling here. What I saw was horrible and... I'm really struggling with it. I think that's probably one of the bravest things you can do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, you, know, you can train you can train resilience, mm -hmm. right? But the, the the fact of the matter is that in those kind of roles, um, jobs, and it's the same with blue lights, blue light services, right? It's that in those jobs, people are going to be pushed to the limits, and some people really reach reach their limits and end up getting ill because of it, physically mm -hmm. or mentally, you know. And the key is is to identify that quickly and treat retrain mm. treat get them improved to back to the level where they need to be to go back into the job where they're mm. comfortable to go back into the job where they're where they're ready to go back in again overcome that illness whatever mm. it may be and more often than not when you find that you're not only bringing someone back into the whatever the role is that it's got this huge amount of experience because they've been there before and done it. It's got a huge amount of experience. You're bringing them back into a position where they are now, they are, they have now experienced that illness or injury, mm. physical or mental, themselves. They're probably stronger than they were before because of that. They're definitely more well informed than they were before because yeah. of that, and they're definitely more capable. At being in a leadership position where they may have soldiers, sailors, airmen and women under their command who experience mental health mm. themselves and they'll be in a much better place to deal with it than someone who hasn't experienced it themselves. I, do, I really think it's like, they, they just, people have overcome, overcome adversity, especially yeah. on the mental health illness side, and mm. they're great people to be in those positions of command. Yeah. They're stronger than they were before. They've been there, they've done it, faced it, and they're, they're, they're mm. great people to be advocates of getting mental Ill health treated. Mm. You know, which um, which has definitely been lacking in the past. Yeah. Uh, it's never going to be a problem that goes away. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely not. No, I think you know this because it's not just you, you know veterans are struggling. I think it's the society. I mean, the the increase in the amount of mental illness that we're seeing across the board, particularly post COVID, I think is just yeah, we're really struggling with the. How the bad numbers. is it? I've heard it. I've heard it referred to anecdotally mm. you know, over the last few years, but I've got I don't know any detail on it. So would you mind yeah. enlightening me? It, it's really bad. It's really bad. Services are underfunded, and that we just haven't got a lot of the the beds have been cut so there's not as many like inpatient beds as we used to have so the nhs services we all know how bad the nhs is at the moment anyway but there aren't the services there to support the community services the inpatient services there aren't the members of staff to be able to support people because everybody's off on the sick everyone's on long-term sick themselves because actually doing a job in mental health in the UK in the moment is really bloody hard. It's really hard work. And so a lot of people are struggling themselves. A lot of people are having to go off on long-term sick. So that means that services are even more depleted. And somebody could put their hand up and go to the GP and say, you know, I'm really, really struggling. GP does their best to manage them best they can at primary care. Feels like actually we can't um, manage this anymore. It needs to go to secondary care. So we'll come to some of the community services. But you might be waiting like months and months and months to even get your initial assessment, you know, access to psychological therapies. You know, we, we've got the IAPT programme, which is improving access to psychological therapies. That's supposed to be able to 
get you to be able to speak to somebody and for talking therapies quickly but again the amount of people that are needing to try and have a bit of therapy a bit of talking therapy to help them you know the waiting lists are just astronomical as the as the bar being lowered for um people who are deemed requiring therapy for example um i mean they got a bit softer yeah, ther- therapy is something that I think everybody could probably benefit from, if you know what I mean. But I know, you know. <laughs> See, I thought that until recently. Mm. And I'm thinking, not maybe not. Okay. And, well, obviously it's a case-by-case basis. And the reason being is that it can, I think they can, it may develop into an over-reliance on third parties to fix the problems that you could maybe fix and manage yourselves internally mm. but i think mm. that's definitely a skill we've lost over the years especially since these stupid smartphones yeah. appeared and social media yeah, appeared yeah, yeah. you know internal processing of information and situations and feelings and all of that i think we've lost that um that's the only concern with mm. that i there's an there, uh, there's an advert there's a uh, i listen to the joe rogan podcast a lot and one of the ads that is on his podcast now is called I think it's called Better Health, mm. right? And it's basically an app. You pay monthly, you get access to therapy immediately. And one of the examples it's giving about going a great time to go and use the app to get your therapy, however much you pay to get the therapy mm. like that when you need yeah. it. The example is that you've been out socialising all weekend, your social battery is a bit depleted. It, mm. This is literally what it is. Social battery is a bit depleted to come in and get therapy. Like, use the app, talk to the therapist to overcome this i'm thinking that no 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 it's fucking normal that's yeah. not why why would we encourage to go and get therapy for that example because to me that is bonkers it seems to <laughs> it me sounds, like, like yeah whoa whoa, whoa, whoa i mean whoa. to me that sounds like a company that's trying to make money out of vulnerable people that you know people that are a bit it's more a sign susceptible of the times, to like though, I think. maybe it is and i think we do that quite a lot in society in case of you know throw money at stuff or you need this supplement or you need a bit of turmeric in your diet you need to be having this protein powder or this that and the other and everybody's exploiting people online for money it's you know it's a long-standing issue and i think in mental health people are thinking oh i know everyone's struggling with a bit of anxiety at the moment everyone's struggling with a bit of mental health let's get on the bandwagon and throw out a bit of crap therapy yeah. there yeah. yeah i'm not suggesting that like i don't think things like that are particularly useful yes of course you know i think we are losing the ability to be able to understand what is a normal human emotion it's normal to feel a little bit anxious it's normal to feel sad sometimes it's normal to you know have these a, a depleted social battery it's normal to have all these things we're sometimes over you know pathologizing some of these symptoms you say over pathologizing yeah, yeah we're making it into a disorder yeah. aren't we saying actually this is anxiety but really when we're thinking about anxiety disorder in its truest sense it needs to have an impact on your ability to function as a human being. So that's what we're talking about. So there's a difference, isn't there? I've got a new one for you. <laughs> I've got a new one for you. No, I, I agree. I totally, I totally agree with you. That's interesting. Over, over pathologizing. So you talk, in layman's terms, people would say they want to give everything a label. Yeah, label absolutely. everything. Don't Everyone they? wants a label, don't they? And everybody wants to think, actually, why am I feeling like this? Give me a reason for it. You know, it's the same way somebody's got a runny nose and they go to the GP and they go, why am I, why have I got a runny nose? Tell me what my diagnosis is, doctor. And they go, I don't know. I think you've probably got a bit of a virus. Well, no, I want to know exactly, like, what virus? What can you do to treat me? I want a pill for it. It's the answers. And I think that's the culture that we're getting from, you know, always having that information at your fingertips, isn't it? It's the sort of that satisfying, that I need to know, I need to know, I need to know, I need to know now. What is it that's wrong with me? Tell me. I want to get your hot take on something. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to read you an article. Uh, it's from a website called Four Hour Men. Okay. Four, I've never heard of this before. Fourhourmen.com. Four Hour Men discussing men's mental and emotional health without the bullshit exclamation mark. Okay. The headline is What is Moral Injury? Mm. Have you heard this? Yeah. Have you? Okay. In this article, we look at moral injury, how you can identify it, acknowledge its impact, and look after yourself if experiencing it. Okay. Moral injury is a relatively new term in a psychological and academic lexicon, mostly due to Shea whoever that is, and predominantly only discussed in the context of military well-being, as that mm. is where he recognised it. However, the majority of us will have experienced many moral injuries throughout our lives. So how then it goes on to how moral injuries show up in the workplace. Um, 
if you work in a team, for example, and one individual is always late and consistently does the bare minimum, facing no disciplinary or corrective action, therefore forcing the rest of you to pick up their slack, it can be morally injurious to one or several of you. Uh, symptoms of moral injury, mm. feelings of guilt, shame, anger, depression, anxiety, low self-esteem, sense of betrayal, change in world view, distrusting of others, loss of faith in people's situations, lack of intimacy, loss of faith, social withdrawal, nightmares, disturbed sleep, self-medicating, suicidal ideation. It sounds to me that moral injury is one of those over-pathologizing instances. Go on, tell me I'm wrong. So I think the example, I'm all ears, I'm I, think all ears. The, I think the example they've given there is a real um, is an interesting one. So when I've come under, across the term moral injury, it's you know been in the terms of the military, also in the NHS, particularly around COVID. So there's a lot of moral injury, and we think when I think of an, an example, is like when the nursing staff were not allowed to allow the families of the dying in to sit by their bedside. So they'd have to say to them, sorry, we can't let you in because of the COVID rules of the hospital or whatever. You can't hold your dying relative's hand. Okay. And I think that for the nursing staff and the medical staff that were supporting those people that were dying caused a moral injury. So when we mean what we mean Upset by that... People. Yeah, but it, it goes against your core being, your core morals. As a nurse, you're wanting to help people you want to provide somebody with a good death if death is coming you want that death to be supported in a good environment in, in you know surrounded by your loved ones and they're having to stop people from seeing their loved ones in their final hours because of the rules of the hospital you know and that to me you know we're thinking about damaging their core self their core being their their moral self and that can either be from doing something that damages that or by inaction by not doing it maybe walking past something on the street that you know you feel why didn't i step in there why didn't i do something you know i'm a good person why didn't i stop that person being beaten up why didn't i stop and help them yeah and that can actually be really damaging to somebody because they think what does that say about me as a person if i did that what does that say about me that's guilt mm. yeah I, my, I think my issues with the language Hmm. I think I feel like the language is being pitched in a way that opens up opportunities for another, you know, in, this, in the litigation industry in the states. Yeah. Law, you know, what are the, the compensation culture somewhat over here. You know, I think hmm. that I think that's my issue with it. Hmm. Is that we're talking about? Yeah, having your feelings here guilt in that last example you said there but injury don't know i don't like the language don't like what what do you understand by the term injury what does that mean to you (laughs) injury injury i would so injury a physiological physical a physical you you compromise in some way physically Physically. 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 But not mentally. Not mentally. Why? Uh, be I would prefer to a, so a mental issue as being ill, mentally ill. Mm. So that's me. Mm. It's just interesting, isn't <laughs> don't, it? Don't mean me <laughs> like that. I <laughs> feel like I feel like that is. <laughs> you know, like that's my you're psychiatrist shit, look, you? isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> I do that. Hmm. Interesting. Um, <laughs> I think it's really interesting how we split physical and mental health. Like, you know, the head is separated from the body. You know, I think we've got this dichotomy, haven't we? That Mm -hmm. even in terms of how we manage these problems, physical health is managed in an acute hospital. Mental health is managed in a mental hospital and neither the two shall meet and they are separate. In Derby, um, which is where I am, we have the acute hospital and there's a the road, the inner road of the hospital separates it from the from the mental health hospital. But we're in a different trust. We use different computer systems, different way of ordering things, completely different financial system, everything. It's oh. kept completely separate. And you find me a mental health patient that doesn't have a physical health problem. And you find me a physical health patient that's got a significant problem, yeah. injury or whatever, that's not suffering in some way with their mental health. We have separated, you know, we have caused this dichotomy 
usually in the 50s and 60s when we were having the development of lots of the mental health drugs antidepressants things like that and physical health really took off in terms of imagery like doing x-rays ct scans that you know physical health had this boom all the research we started being able to treat loads of things and after that we separated we didn't have this in victorian times you know they dealt with this whole thing you know we have the idea of like hysteria caused by the uterus you know hysterectomy you know all these sort of origins of terms physical health and mental health is that where that yeah. term comes from no so physical health and mental health was intertwined and so it should be you cannot have your mind without your body and you can't have your body without your mind and yet we've separated it and so now we think of physical health as being like proper you know you can be injured physically but you can't be injured mentally but again so just coming back to this, just, just to go back to mm. briefly touch on this hypothetical decision in the past about the patriarchy. Yeah. We haven't, I don't think we separated mental and physical health. I think we evolved to a point where we realised they're not separate. We need to bring them together. Well, we need to bring them together now. Yeah, yeah. They so did that's separate. What I mean. They never used to be separate. Really? We used to treat all the conditions the same. Like, when people were having problems, you know, women's problems and you know is it it was all like you know you think about all these things that happened in the victorian times you like read about it. i'm not like an expert in all this like sort of historical medicine and things but you know you look back through it and you see, see how we were doing things we give me an example well like um oh, let me think so like i was saying about this whole idea of hysteria and this idea that hysteria and the condition hysteria and mental condition was caused by um, the uterus as a woman and that th they would have this um this energy that would move around the body at certain times and you know maybe this could be cured by removing the uterus and things like that there's loads of these like you know back in freudian times and like the victorian eras and stuff like that where we were just we were we were dealing with things much more holistically and you have to think about mental health conditions like you have physical symptoms your physiological self changes due to men your mental health so even in the very simplest terms you feel sad you cry a salty release of a tear from your tear duct is a physiological reaction <clears throat> to an emotion you know you're embarrassed your cheeks flush that's to do with the capillaries and like the redness in your cheeks right we it's all interacting it's all related you know we see people with depression they have what we call biological symptoms of depression so their sleep will be affected they won't be able to um they won't eat very much you know so those things their gut slows down so quite often they get constipated you know they have a real slowness of all their physiological mechanisms to think that they're separate to try and separate mm -hmm. them physically you know it, in the fact that we've got two separate hospitals that we can think about somebody as a separate entity mm. that we refer in terms like completely still to this day that things are very separate you can have a physical injury but you can't have a you know a mental injury a moral injury in that way yeah, we, least... we still think about it separately everybody's guilty of it i'm not just saying you know oh it's it's you because everybody does it you know myself included sometimes you know we forget we are one you know we think about the gut brain axis and how you know it, it, it's all it's all related yeah it's yeah. something I'm, I'm i've become super in tune with over the last few years not in, not yet in tune i'd say like the that mental physical relationship mm. if i'm well it's the obvious one if you if you get really i say it's an obvious one if you get really stressed yeah i the only time i ever get ill is when i'm stressed i get stressed and then i get ill and it's yeah. like it's normally just run down a bit sneezy a bit coffee yeah it happens when i get run down beef after i get run down but i was uh i i interviewed a guy called uh dr mark gordon he does tbi research uh, predominantly blast tbi research mm. in, in the states um and he's really prominent in the field and he produced a film called i think it's called quiet explosions and in the film did we talk about this on the phone i think we did i think we, we did when done. we spoke on the phone and in the film Quiet explosions. There's five or six different people interviewed. They're all American. Uh, uh, yeah, they're all Americans. One's an American football player, and they're all suffering from a TBI. Mm. Um, uh, and they've got a physiological condition with that. Um, neurophysiological condition with it. One's an American football player. One's a Green Beret. Uh, there's another guy. I can't remember what he did. And there's a lady. Uh, ladies, U.S. Navy. The the three guys. 
they they their condition was caused by either blast concussion uh, a blast a blast injury mm -hmm. uh, a, a blast event or like repeat concussions to the head uh, uh, for example the American football player the lady had exactly the same symptoms as them she had uh, post traumatic stress disorder although Mark wouldn't describe it as that. She had post-traumatic stress disorder, all the things that go with that, and all the neurophysiological things that they had. Mm. The difference was, she had no concussion concussion to the head. She was not around any blast, anything. She was US Navy, but she never deployed anything, was mm. never around any weapons firing. What she experienced was rape. Mm. She wasn't, vi she, apart from the, uh, the rape itself, as in the physical side of it, the sexual side of it, there was no violence involved. Mm. Yet she was presenting the same symptoms physiologically as the other people. And that because the psycho, to, um, to your point, the psychological event that she experienced physiologically changed her. It changed the physical makeup mm. of her brain. Yeah. And that's a really hard thing for people to wrap their head around. They go, what? Yeah. yeah. Like your emotional experiences will fuck you over physically. Absolutely. Fuck you over physically. It's why, yeah, and, and in the reverse, people who are, people who have, physical conditions, either they're born with it or they occur afterwards, they're quite very often, unfortunately, they're much more likely to develop mental conditions down the line and additional physical conditions like chronic things and diseases and that because it screws everything up. Absolutely. You, know, uh, well, you can see, you can see like um, people that have had like adverse childhood experiences. So what we mean by that is like trauma in childhood. You can see changes to their brain on brain scans, you know, and it's the same with like schizophrenia and other sort of chronic mental health conditions. You know, we're starting to be able to see, you know, with the development of better scanning technologies and better understanding of what parts of the brains are affected, we can see these changes, you know, these are real things. I think what psychiatry has struggled with over time is that we haven't got that blood test we haven't got that one single gene that you can sort of isolate and say oh I'm taking your blood now I can tell you've got depression and for some reason that sort of affects the legitimacy of some of these conditions and you say well you know isn't, isn't he just a bit sad I mean shouldn't he just you know is his feelings a bit hurt you know when we think about these things it's these dismissive terms isn't it because you actually you can't tell the severity of something because it's so subjective. You have to ask the person, how are you feeling? They go, oh, I'm absolutely fucking terrible. And then you think to yourself, what have they got to be feel shit about? Their life's really great, you know? It's that lack of understanding, partially because we don't have those, the ways to properly measure it yet, to be able to, you know, to, to do it in the same way as if I took a blood test of you, I said, oh, we've got diabetes. You'd be like, oh, I've got diabetes now. If I could do a blood test and I say, oh, actually, I can see that you've got, you know, depression would that legitimize it a bit more i don't know or is it are we just looking at people's subjective experiences and saying well actually but yeah that, this is enough to classify it as depression that, in my opinion. that ability is being developed though so so i don't know if you were uh, you may or may not be have you heard of a, a lady called mandy bostwick i think the name sounds familiar she's a I'm trying to think of the term what should we call herself a specialist trauma psychotherapist maybe but she works along works with not well, the same field as Mark on that mm -hmm. research, and one of the things that they would say, um, in fact, I'll send, you, I'll send you the episodes they did because when That'd I really when I'm trying to get people to understand the physical mental relationship, yeah. I send them these three episodes, and it, that's going to be four episodes now. <laughs> one of them is Mandy's, the second one yeah. is Mark's, and the third one's the Green Beret was in the film. Yeah. And one of the things, that, so they aren't particularly they don't particularly champion the the psychiatry in the UK's ability to deal with mental ill health in mm. people who have experienced trauma. And for the, I think for the reason you're touching on, like they ignore, they feel like the neurophysiological side is being ignored. Mm. Like, why are you not looking at this? You're looking at the psych, psychiatry, but you're also not looking at what's going on in the brain, mm. you know, on a neuroendocrinological yeah. level. So they would say that, Imagine a world where you can baseline everyone. Uh, you can baseline a soldier, sailor, airwoman, airman, airwoman, you know, and, mm. and uh, baseline their hormone levels, for example, yeah. in their brain, before, when they join up. And you monitor those periodically, or you check them after certain events, mm. certain things happen. Hey, you were just in a massive firefight. You were just attacked by mortars and rockets. Yeah. Uh, you need to come and 
get checked out. And one of the things they check is, you're all my levels are going shit. Mm. This is off the charts. This we need to bring, and, try, and you bring it back to baseline. Mm. When you bring the the neuroendocrinological side back to baseline, everything looks normal. Then you look at what psychological issues still remain. Yeah, I think that's what they were saying. I think I think that's coming forward. Have you heard anything on that? I mean, what would you? What do you think I know there's there's research that's happening. I know that at the moment, I don't think we've got anything that's sophisticated enough to really say, yeah, this this is what we can measure and this is right for you know, that's um, measurable across a lot of people. Um, but with the thing about psychiatry is there's so much, there's so much research that's going on at the moment. There's so many new things that are coming out. It's not, you know, it's, it's really positive. And I think that's one of the reasons why I chose to do psychiatry is that because, you know, in the next 10, 15 years, we'll probably be talking completely different <coughs> things. You know, we'll be using completely different treatments. We'll be using lots of different investigations. Maybe there will be those, you know, ways of being able to, to measure things and to monitor progress and things like that a little bit better than we've got at the moment. That's quick. Know? Yeah. 10, 15 years, you reckon? So what, I think what, there'll be what, some differences. What, I'm, where, not, I'm not suggesting that we'll, you know, <laughs> then it'll be solved. Oh, my God, you know, but... No, but where, so where, where are you, what aspects of the, um, of the progress are you most excited about at the minute then? So there's a number of different things that I really think has got good value. I think one of the things I think we lose focus on is, um, I, I think, lifestyle. As a, I think we're very quick sometimes in psychiatry, in general practice, in medicine in general, in pushing a pill, saying, here you go, I have this tablet. And I don't think that's necessarily the answer in a lot of places. What I always think about using medication in treatment is it's a bit like getting the, a leg up over a wall. So, you know, you're doing an assault course and your mucker's on the bottom and he's got his, you know, <coughs> you stand up on his knee and he pushes you over the wall. That's to me is what an anti antidepressant or an antipsychotic or the psychiatric medication should do. But you will still have to get over the wall and you have to be in a certain condition to be able to get over the wall in the first place. But it can, it can give you that little bit of a, a jump. So, lifestyle factors and there's a you know really good emerging field of psychiatry called nutritional psychiatry which looks at how we can treat mental health with nutrition but it also comes into those pillars of um lifestyle medicine which are really important so you're making sure you're getting a good night's sleep making sure you do some exercise you know lifestyle medicine yeah. i've never heard that term before. have you not so it's it's um there's a british society of lifestyle medicine which is now um, really sort of getting some momentum in being able to think as a basic, these are the things that we should be doing. You know, we should be making sure we do regular exercise, that we should be getting a good night's sleep, that we should be well hydrated, that we should be eating the right foods, you know, and that we can, you know, we employ some mindfulness <coughs> techniques. We like look after yourself in those sort of like main pillars. And that's really important. It's easy to say, oh, go out and do some exercise. But if you are bedridden with severe depression, that's not very realistic, is it? But what we do try, so if I go and see anybody, I don't so much anymore because I mainly work with people with psychosis, but, you know, when I was working in, with depression, um, you know, I'd go to them and I'd say, okay, let's, let's take something little baby steps, you know, let's see when you, if you're able to eat a meal, let's try and make it as balanced as you can be. But you need to get people to a certain stage before you can really go beyond that. And medication can help with that. So I would give somebody an antidepressant, for example, to get them to a stage to be able to get out of bed. And then I can talk to them about, OK, let's have a look at your diet. Let's have a look at that. There's a really good study that came out in um, from Australia, from the Food and Mood Centre in Melbourne. It's called the SMILES trial, which was done a few years ago now, which was actually able to treat depression with diet. With diet I, alone. I, I, I am not surprised to watch. I'm sure there are people listening to this. We were like, what? Mm. You're talking rubbish. <laughs> but, you know, that, again, we were talking about experience and coming through. Yeah. and It does not surprise me at all. I This is why people feel like shit mm. after they eat shit. <laughs> the over-processed food, oh the God. food... The, the, food industry that we are like living within at the moment and that are pumping us full of these chemicals, it's doing us no good whatsoever. You know, and I think... You know, there is some stuff out there to say, you know, this could be the reason, you know, we think about depression as being an inflammatory condition and we're seeing this inflammation in the gut and how can we address that? We can address that through diet. We can address that through meal timings. You know, there's lots of different research that's coming out in this area. And I think that's really, really interesting. What about, so go back to Australia, try before I jumped in and interrupt yeah. you again. Sorry. Okay. So 
give me some more details on that. So what did they, what, are they, what, are they, what was the study, what did they find? So they took, I think there was um, 67 people or so, which they took um, into a trial, a 12 week trial, um, with a placebo group and a, um, a regular group. They gave the regular group um, food hampers and nutritional advice and basically followed the Mediterranean diet. So for those people that don't know, the Mediterranean diet is quite high in like sort of oily fish, um, lots of fruits and vegetables mainly. You can have like a glass of wine <coughs> should you want, you know, that's not restricted, but you know, obviously you know, within normal limits, not going too crazy with that, but basically following the Mediterranean diet. And these people did that for 12 weeks and the placebo group was controlled by, um, they'd still meet somebody every so often as the, the dietary group did, but they were having sort of general sort of chats. It was sort of, it's, it's the usual way that you can normally um, uh, control for people that are having regular sort of meetups. So it's similarly done in like ones that are testing for psychological therapies and things like that. So basically it was Mediterranean diet. And what they found was um, even though these people had tried multiple psychiatric medications in the past, multiple antidepressants, a, a third of the study uh, went into remission, like full remission from their depression. So high, high protein, high fat, So low using carb. like extra virgin olive oil, lots of fruit and vegetables. There's quite a specific like Mediterranean diet sort of protocol. Low carb. Um, carbs were allowed, but not like, you know, nothing no, no, over processed, yeah. nothing, nothing over processed, whole foods, that sort of thing. Mm. And a third of the patients went into remission. That's crazy, isn't it? Yeah. Without medication? Without medication. Well, some of them may have been on a medication already, but no changes to that medication in, in a number of weeks preceding the trial. So they were thinking that, so although it wasn't like they were medication free, there'd been no changes to that enough to say that any changes weren't really as a result of the medication. It's a really, really like like quite groundbreaking trial in terms of nutritional psychiatry and how we can not only sort of prevent people from becoming mentally unwell, but actually treat it. Um, and there's a lot of people, there's, you know, there's some people that, oh, you know, more research needs to be done, but there are, are loads more trials that are coming out that are looking at very similar things. But I think it's so obvious to people that actually pay attention to their diet and, and, and a bit more sensitive to how it impacts them than, other, than those who are not. It makes yeah. total sense to me what you're saying. Yeah. Um, I think uh, a lot of the patients I always used to see, I worked in a crisis team, so that's the kind of, um, so we'd see people that were not as an inpatient um, in a hospital, but they were very risky in terms of being in the community. So people that were very depressed, psychotic, manic, um, you know, risk of um, ending their life, things like that. I, I'd worked in that team. Quite often when I saw any of the depressed patients that were that kind of severe level, I mean, depression, is, like I've mentioned before, affects your, ability, your appetite, so you don't feel particularly hungry nobody was eating a good diet nobody was saying like oh like i was even when you know what was your diet like before this episode it was always you know when you'd have a sandwich that was what people were living on sandwiches nobody's ever said oh, i eat 30 fruits and veg you know a week you know i've got a really well varied diet and I eat five types of fermented foods and you know all this sort of good stuff that you're supposed to do nobody was doing that you know that food isn't championed. It's getting less and less championed these days. It's just, yeah, it doesn't it's, make any money, does it? Because it's all, you know, I've got to sound really cynical, but I just think it's all about, you know, the food industry. They're pushing these foods to people, particularly low-income families that are struggling with money, with time. You know, here, have this, like, turkey twizzler or whatever. You know, have this really horrible over-processed stuff. You know, quick, go into a convenience store, grab something, you know. And it's, it's killing us. I truly believe that all those like it's never going to be good for you to have all those chemicals in your body. I don't, you know, no, I don't care. It's, it's dumbing us down and it's making us more prone to illness for sure. Yeah, for sure. You a know. physical illness and mental illness. You know, it's not just going to make you more prone to diabetes, to cardiovascular disease, you increase risk of stroke, all those sort of things. Also, making you more susceptible to mental ill health as well. Yeah. Um, uh, have you seen? Have you? looked into or seen any of the statistics related to mental ill health and psychosis mm. to do with vegan diets no i haven't oh go on my God. <laughs> go on this sounds interesting well, i i Gosh. wish i'd brought some notes on it i i went i did i started a deep dive middle of last year on different types of diets mm. read, a, read two or three books um 
vegan and vegetarian diets and they weren't just sort of diet orientated they were, one of them was one of them was uh, uh, you know carbon footprint oriented mm-hmm. this kind yeah. of stuff but one of the really striking things was um, the increased risks of mental ill health and physical ill health for people on um, on on high carb and high uh, high grain mm. diets, it was just like shocking. So, it's shocking. Just, you know, we still need to make sure that we are hitting those three major food groups, right? You need to have your protein, your carbs, and your fats. You need to make sure that you have the micronutrients as well. You need to try. I know a lot of vegan. Um, people eat quite a lot of over-processed food because we've got a lot of these meat substitutes these days and a lot of the some of those things can be really over-processed and I think that's a risk as well and I think if anything's overly restrictive I think it, there can be issues with being overly restricted in any form of diet you know that can cause problems in itself so you know I don't I don't like you know when I'm apart from cutting out over-processed stuff but I mean trying to really right limit what you are able to eat can have an effect on many different things psychologically it can have an impact on you so i always think we always try and oversimplify things i think in this day and age don't we and it's you know always helps with these like clickbait things on the internet and these big headlines that says oh this can cause this and the other but with everything that we do you know it is multifaceted we have to think about everything from what we say a biopsychosocial approach so yes it'll affect the biology it'll affect you psychologically and there's a psychological impact and you know, let's not try and oversimplify things. I don't think it is quite as easy as saying, you know, vegan diets can cause this. You know, there's probably hundreds of different reasons why that might be the case. Maybe. (laughs) Cogs are turning. (laughs) Uh, Well. We do oversimplify things. Yeah, definitely. Um, To make things more palatable to people to, to be able to... To, to read and digest as information, right? We do it all the time. We see it on social media. Social media is rife with things that are just oversimplified. You know, mm-hmm. let's just say this. And 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 orientate us towards as you alluded to just now. Orientate us towards orientate us towards buying and consuming the stuff that is really cheap to make hmm. by the manufacturer, which normally means full of shit. Shit, yeah. Full of shit. Real bad. Uh, how did we get on to that? We were talking about advances in psychiatry and I talked about nutritional psychiatry. That so should we step away from veganism? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and diets, because that's not yeah. what we were talking about. <laughs> yeah. Go on, so the Australia study. Yeah. Okay, what else? What other, what other advances are exciting you at the moment? Oh gosh, let's think. Um, there's lots of different things. I think, like I say, it's not just sort of the medications, because I think we've had a real... Um, difficulties with development of new psychiatric medications over time and we do still rely quite a lot on a lot of the old medications you know there's a lot of the like the typical antipsychotics like haloperidol and things like that are still really widely used you know we're still using these old medications from like the 60s and 70s and there hasn't been there's new stuff that's coming out but it's still not really being adopted as this like you what's know, the problem with the old stuff there like well there's a lot of the old stuff can cause a lot of side effects you know and you can think about, I think everybody has in their mind this image of the stereotyped, um, you know, asylum patient, you know, and what they look like. And a lot of the older medications really like over sedating, you know, cause hypersalivation, you know, they can cause loads One of One flew over the cuckoo's nest yeah, stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that caused so much damage to <clears throat> sort of psychiatry. The ECT, electroconvulsive therapy, we still use that now. But I think a lot of patients are really fearful of it because of um, that. I do still use that. Yeah. Really? Yes. Zapping bolts in people's brains. Yeah. Electric bolts. Why, mm. so why would you use that treatment? Like, t- tell me why, what, what would it be used for and how is it beneficial? So I, EC- I didn't realise we were still using yeah, it. Yeah, so. ECT is actually really, really effective. We only tend to use it in people with severe life-threatening depression. So um, people like, that are so depressed, they are literally sort of on the bed, can't eat, can't drink you know, completely shut down with their depression. And that's how bad it can get. And I think, you know, when we think about mental health, you know, people often just think about your chap that's going down the GP surgery feeling a bit sad because his life got shit. But actually this is like, this can kill people, you know, it can kill people from, you know, they're not getting the right um, fluid. They're not 
eating enough you know they'll literally just lie there and die and that's how bad it can get so we can use it for that sometimes it can be used in some sort of treatment resistant schizophrenia as well although very rarely and we can use it in things like catatonia how does it work Ah, so this is the interesting thing. We don't really know. Oh, so. great. <laughs> I don't know how it works. Do I'm going to tell you all this. So <laughs> I, I like to think about it as being a bit like, there's lots of theories out there about it sort of um, stimulating like neurotransmitters or opening new pathways in the brain. But, um, you know, it's it's similar to in the way that they're starting to use like psychedelics in the treatment of depression, yeah, and all that sort of stuff. We're starting to use transmagnetic stimulation. That's a new thing that we're bringing in, which is more palatable, I think, than ECT for people because it doesn't involve the general anaesthetic and, you know, the shots and stuff, and it can be used through the magnetic um, waves at particular parts of the brain. It's these sort of these ideas of like, almost like a brain reset. And I think that's um, the idea behind ECT. But unfortunately, people think it's barbaric because of what they've seen on the TV, and that's not how it is done. And I've seen it really save people's lives, and I and I and I don't say that lightly, you know. And I don't want people to think that I'm like exaggerating. But I've seen people like being wheeled in, completely not speaking, not doing anything, and like you know, a few weeks down the line, we do tend to do it like twice a week. Um, you know, you see them like two or three weeks later, and they're coming in and going, "Oh, hi, doctor, you're all right. You know, how are you doing? Really? Having a full conversation with you." And I, the first time I ever see it, saw it work so well, I like I cried, and I was like in there. And it was during I, luckily I had a mask on and a shield over my face because it was during COVID, and I could not believe the difference I saw in this lady. She'd come in, um, I'd seen her. She was on my ward, and she was so distressed. She had agitated depression, so she wasn't in the same sort of state as a lot of people with depression are. She was like very what we can imagine, agitated, constantly going to try and get a glass of water. She was like all over the place, like really, really, really distressed. Couldn't sit still beside herself with like um, anxiety, you know, this symptom. It was awful to see. And a couple of weeks later, I think I'd gone on leave or something and I'd come back in and I'd seen it. And she she came, she walked into the the, the, um, clinic where we were doing the ECT She'd got a makeup on, she brushed her hair, she dressed his clothes. Oh and God. I just saw her and I went, oh my God. And I like, literally, and I was saying, don't, you know when you're like, don't cry, don't cry, don't cry. You know, I'm a doctor, I can't possibly cry. Luckily she wasn't talking, she was talking to other people. But I had like tears in my eyes. I'd never seen anything like it in my life. It saved her life. Yeah. And I am a, a, you know, I know people are fearful of it and they're scared because they've seen these things. But it can genuinely, if you are that unwell, you know, it, it, it can really be a life-saving well, thing. In my mind, that's miracle cure. That's, yeah. that's the kind yeah. of thing you say, oh, my God. Yeah. She wasn't going back. Yeah. Yeah, that is miracle cure. I yeah. did not realise that was still in use. Yeah, I know. Wow. Yeah. Hmm. I was going to ask you a question there. Oh, you mentioned psychedelics. Mm. I've interviewed a bunch of people about psychedelics. Yeah. May or might not have some experience myself. <laughs> um, wh- so I, I was under the impression that generally in the field of psychology, there, uh, psychiatry, there is a stigma and a resistance where psychedelics are concerned mm. for in terms of treatment mm. of mental ill health. Would that be correct to say? I would. I in would... your experience. In my experience, I think, yes. Yeah, there is. Why do you think that is? Um, I think it's difficult. People are not sure how it's working, why it's working. ECG. (laughs) (laughs) This is it. I know, know, exactly. I know. But it's something new. So let's be, you know, let's be careful. Um, I think there's always, you know, we've seen with drugs particularly, a lot of drugs can cause a lot of psychiatric conditions. So you, with with thinking generalizing of, drugs, you mean and drugs ge- and generalizing, I'm talking what do I illicit drugs? Ill- is what okay. we would say uh, illegal drugs. Illegal drugs. Okay. So you know it can kickstart somebody into it. You can have a drug induced psychosis that may develop into a schizophrenia. You know, we, um, whether you know, there's a lot of people that have got substance misuse issues that try and medicate themselves and their mental health issues with substances which causes you know more harm than good and i think there's a real concern within the world of psychiatry that we're actually taking some of these illicit substances and using them to treat when we've been so against them in the past 
Um, and that's that's drugs generally, not saying, you know, I know psychedelics is slightly different in terms of, I'm not saying it's the same as shooting up with heroin, you know, and I definitely don't feel that way. However, I think there is a concern, you know, we've always said no to drugs, drugs are bad, don't touch the drugs. And now we're saying, well, actually, maybe these drugs would be okay, you know, it's... It's a bit of a mind shift, and I think sometimes, particularly in the world of psychiatry and medicine in general, we're slow to change our minds about things. Mm. So, yeah, but it's really interesting, really exciting. I'm not an expert in any way, but I think it's you know it, it's fantastic. I know what I'd do if I had severe depression. I'd be get, having some mushrooms or something. For sure. <laughs> <laughs> it's the first thing I do. I mean, I'd be obviously in my bed, so but I'd have my husband to be going out picking him. When's the month September or something? I don't know. Yeah. Anyway, I would definitely get some. That's how I would treat myself. I interviewed a lady recently called Professor uh, Jo Neal, <clears throat> and Jo, uh, which university is she lecturer at? I can't remember. Anyway, she used to be. For I think thirty years, thirty-five year career as a in bio, uh, so, so, psychopharmacology, wow. in psychopharmacology, yeah. yeah, thirty odd years in it, and then I don't know how she got interested or how it came on a radar, but psychedelics as a mm. treatment came on a radar seriously, and she had this moment of I've just wasted it the last thirty-five years in this. What have I? What have I been doing? And now she's gone full. Yeah. This, she, she. I think she had a similar experience mm. in that ECG moment mm. of seeing that miracle cure and that. Holy mm. shit! Like I don't yeah. know, pati- know which particular substance it was, but something switched her. And she she left the psychopharmacology industry, and now she's a psychedelic researcher, an advocate for it over here. Mm. Which it gives me hope. It seems to be totally gone the right I'm way. I'm really hopeful about it in the future. I see it as you've got this field yeah. of, you've got this whole scope of drugs and substances, right? Yeah. And some of them are bad in certain circumstances. Mm. Some of them are bad in most circumstances, and others are good in most circumstances. It's like, we've got all these tools, try and understand yeah. them all, and use them to treat where we can and where we think they're safe and where they're, both, they're best applied. And I just see psychedelics, again, that general term, as in this box that is yeah. just their untapped resource. Just get into it and start unpacking it. Absolutely. And this is what I say when I say about the advances in psychiatry in the next 10 to 15 years. This is an area I really think is gaining a lot of traction. And I really hope that we'll be able to use it a bit more um, regularly than we're seeing at the moment. I I went to another uh, conference last year, I think it was, we were talking about MDMA-assisted therapy for PTSD. And that was a really interesting thing. And literally, you just, you know, you have MDMA and the therapist sits with you for like, eight hours as you sort of you know discuss whatever comes into your mind and it's about I think that the theory is it's about how you access your memory and how it's like almost like reprocessing those memories and things like that and I thought that was a really interesting thing to go on that therapist course you have to go and do MDMA like as part of your therapy training apparently so Oh, really? Really interesting. Yeah, they have to go, but they have to do it in America because obviously we can't do it here. Anything goes in California, I think. So they've all been going over there and doing it. But really super interesting stuff. Um, loads of scope to like, you know, I know we always joke, open your mind, you know, but like actually this is what's happening. We well, someone, it. I can't, it may have been Joe actually explained it in this way to me. And there's this, per, you know, this perception that when you, when you take a psychedelic substance, let's say, I don't know, for argument's sake, psilocybin, um, that much so mushrooms that it changes the way your brain's thinking, mm. and it's it is, but not in the way you would suggest. This the suggestion on it is that so when they've done maybe meg scans and MRI or whatever it would be to to monitor brain activity. How would that what would that be called when you're monitoring brain ECG? Um, no, it's so, so you can have like an EEG, which is like monitoring brain waves, or you can do different types of scans, like DAT scans, PET scans, whatever it may be. But no, whatever it was. One of them. <laughs> so what they see with most of the psychedelics is that all the parts of your brain that are working before you're on them, they keep working as mm. they are, but parts of your brain that are, have been as, are asleep yeah. constantly get woken up and start firing and. So you, it's like your brain gets extra capacity to process things in a way it hasn't done before. Mm. So you start, it changes your perception consciously and subconsciously yeah. on, on things, which is why, you know, they say a lot of things work on one-off, one-off treatments and they see yeah. these miracle cures for one-off, not all, not 100%, but, you know, miracle cures, one-off treatments combined with 
psychiatric treatments yeah. helping you to understand what you just experienced when you've been under Whole the influence. biopsychosocial yeah, approach yeah, yeah. to yeah. it you know the bios you, yeah. you, psychedelics you know the, you still need to have your talking therapies your psycho and also you need that social support you need to be going back to a, a good house that supportive environment your community groups you you know so you're not socially isolated it's all about thinking about somebody completely holistically the one thing is not going to do it it needs to be the full package well this is why i think this is one of the major reasons I think we're experiencing this. What I, it seems to be a real rise in mental ill health and, mm -hmm. and yeah, mental illnesses across the population. I think partly the bar's been set lower and we're quick to, I can't remember the term you use, we're quick to label things, yeah, put a label on things in order to monetize that for certain industries. Yeah. But I also think that, yeah, we are, actually, we are actually not coping with changes in society, changes in the world and technology very well things have moved much faster. Our The way we interact with the world and people has changed much faster than our brains have been able to evolve with it. Mm. And one of the key things I think, our, we give ourselves, our brains, much less time, much less opportunity to process things we're experiencing on a millisecond by millisecond basis. Because the only opportunities that we used to have to sit and our brain relaxes and processes things, thoughts, feelings, emotions, events, we've taken, we've stripped those away from ourselves because mm. we're not sitting at the bus stop, and apologies yeah. for listeners, I said this a bunch of times before, we used to sit at the bus stop and do nothing but sit there <laughs> in our own yeah. minds waiting for the bus, or the train, or the taxi, or standing in a queue. Yeah. Standing in a queue, waiting to, I was, gonna, I was about to say, go and get some cash out, with <laughs> cash <laughs> more, standing in a queue to do whatever. You know, we, our brains were processing things. We were thinking about the person we just spoke to. We were thinking about the thing we were going to, going to do. We were thinking about the argument we had with our sister, mother, brother the day before. And subconsciously, our brain was doing a million other things mm. that we weren't aware of in that time. And we don't do that anymore. Mm. Because as soon as we get a chance to do nothing with our hands and do nothing with our feet and do nothing with the steering wheel or the gear stick or yeah. whatever, we occupy our brains with third party shit on part of my language, on Instagram, on Facebook, on TikTok, mm, and whatever it is, on the yeah. BBC News, whatever it is. We don't give ourselves an opportunity to relax. Which is why I think things like as well, like you mentioned earlier, um, you know, um uh wellness techniques, mm. meditation, things like this, uh, they're so much more important now than yeah. they used to be because it's so much more impactful now. I, you know, a, f a five or ten minute meditation for me now is invaluable. My yeah. God, it's yeah. like it's like I've started the day fresh after ten minutes of just a guided meditation for five ten minutes, yeah. because guilty as guilty as charged, I don't give myself the opportunity for my brain to reset enough yeah. as I should do. I think that's one of the major reasons we got this mental ill health issue. Is there a mental a, a real big rise in mental ill health problems? Do you think legitimate? Or is it? I mean, it's difficult to see because I'm I'm in it, so I I feel that there is. You know, mm. I see it every day. I I feel it's got worse. Um, yeah. I in particular areas? Worse. I don't mean I don't mean geographical areas. I mean mental areas. <laughs> I mean, I think it's. I think we're seeing a lot more people with um, depression and anxiety, particularly low level depression and anxiety, you know, going to the GP with stuff, you know, life's hard at the moment. We have to remember that, you know, there's a lot of people struggling with, you know, not being able to afford things, you know, the cost of living crisis, and that's going to have an impact on people's mental health, you know, <clears throat> for, for many different reasons, you know, not only because you know, they sometimes their life's a bit shit, but also because of what they can <coughs> afford, things they can access, they're having to work too hard. They're not, you know, they're trying to support their kids with little money, you know, all of these different things means that you're more susceptible to mental ill health. So the, there's that, you know, I and I, I, I see that there's that sort of rise in those conditions. And then, you know, I know people feel that, you know, the neurodevelopmental conditions, are they being they're being diagnosed more often. And what I mean by that is your ADHD and your autistic spectrum disorders, um, you know? So are they being over-diagnosed? I think that's what some people are worried about. I think personally, we've just got better at 
um, recognising it. I think we've got better at recognising it earlier. And I think sometimes, particularly in women, we're finding that actually more adult women are being recognised as having things like ADHD later in life, whereas they may have just gone through their lives previously, you know, having never have thought that diagnosis. And for some people, I know, you know, I said earlier, we've got to be careful about labelling people. <coughs> but I think for some people, particularly those that suffer with those sort of um, issues actually the label can be really helpful and to sort of identifying how they fit in society and how they can access help for things so um, in some ways yes I do think there is an increase in lots of mental health things and I think in some ways we've just got better at being able to recognize the issues and being able to treat them appropriately and that reassures me I did think I did think it was a, a combination of um, the bar being lowered mm. for certain uh, conditions and a keenness to to overdiagnose or misdiagnose mm. for whatever reason I don't know the world has changed mm. so much and so such crazy ways over the last four or five years you know the only thing I am we're coming up in two hours by the way so I think we're going to need to wrap it up in a minute but mm. the only thing I am very 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 glad of is that I we are having this conversation you in the setting of the UK I would hate to be across the pond in America talking about these things I think it would be a totally different conversation and much more stressful yes. you know I I don't know what you think about the idea of pri NHS privatisation but for me like, no I, don't, I, I think the, the, the further we stay away from that the, mm. the, the closer we risk putting ourselves in the boat that they're in Oh my gosh, we do not know, want to go the way of the American healthcare system, absolutely not. No, no, no. No, no but no, I sometimes no, no. I think, oh, are we going that way? Are we going that way? But I, but I hope not. It has been an absolute pleasure. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Um, what's the conference you're at tomorrow? So I'm at the um, Veterans Mental Health Conference. So that's a, an annual conference that's run um, from the King's, King's Centre of Military Mental Health um, and, and Research. And... It, yeah, it's, it's a really great conference. It's a good opportunity to um, to see what's coming out in, in mental health research, specifically with regards to veterans. So, yeah, I'm really looking forward to it. Excellent. Are you there in a, an attendee capacity? Are I am speaking? in an attendee capacity. I'm not speaking. No, I'm not. I'm not really big into research, and it tends to be the researchers that get the presenting slot. So I work like clinically rather yeah. than um, in a research way. So, but yeah. How can people follow what you're doing or keep up to date on? Um... On so on X, Bex Bennett 9, you can find me there. Um, we've recently started a um, female veterans um, support network, particularly for women that work in healthcare. It's called Sisters in Service, and that can be found at sistersinservice.co.uk. And that's basically a safe space for people such as myself that have been a, um, a female in the military that now work in the healthcare environment for a number of different reasons, because there's a lot of... Um, there's a lot of issues with working in healthcare at the moment, and I think um, the way that we have been trained in the military can actually make it quite difficult to deal with some of the, the issues we're facing in the NHS at the moment. So it's a safe space to be able to discuss those sort of things, promote help-seeking behaviours, you know, talk about shit, that sort of stuff. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's I'll it. Put the link, I'll put the link in the bio. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Enjoy the conference tomorrow. Thanks Thank for your time. You. No problem. Thank you. Okay, God, that was a wild.